Welcome to Reliability Matters, a podcast for the electronic assembly industry. Each episode covers topics related to reliability, best practices, and environmentally responsible assembly techniques with insights from experts across the electronic assembly industry. Now, here's your host, Mike Conrad. Dave Hillman is a metallurgical engineer in the Advanced Operations Engineering Department of Collins Aerospace in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. He serves as a consultant to manufacturing on material and processing problems. He served as a subject matter expert for the lead-free Manhattan Project in 2009. He's published numerous technical papers and was presented with the 2008 SMTA International Conference on Soldering and Reliability Best of Conference Award and was a recipient of the SMTA Member of Technical Distinction Award. Dave was awarded the Da Vinci Medal as a Rockwell Engineer of the Year. He also serves as the chairman of the IPC J Standard 002 Solderability Committee. He's also a member of the SMTA where he serves on the SMTA Journal and Soldering and Surface Mount Technology Journal Technical Paper Review Committees. He's a member of the American Society for Metals the Minerals, Metals, and Materials Society, and IPC. If you're in the electronics industry, you've probably seen Dave at numerous technical conferences imparting wisdom with a unique style to Dave. Here's my conversation with Dave Hillman. Dave Hillman, it's so nice to see you today. Hi, Mike. Glad to be here. Looking forward to having a fun discussion today. Yeah, the only thing that can make it better is if we were having it over a couple of beers and a bar, but... um, that's not the case. So this is the next best thing. Exactly. We'll, we'll do it in 2021 somewhere. Yes, we will. I, I think all of us are ready to, uh, to party in 2021, <laughs> <laughs> even with people we don't know, you know, just pick people off the street and invite them home. It's just, it'll be a welcome, uh, a welcome experience again. So if, um, 2020 were a year, I've seen these memes lately. Um, <laughs> you know, if 2020 were a year, it would be this, and it shows a roll of toilet paper, only someone Photoshopped it into a cheese grater, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. It would or be. A, or a pie filled with gross things, you know? So if 2020 were a year, it would be this. So I think if 2020 were a component, it would be uh, a bottom terminated component. That's the, that's the way 2020 is. That's the way I feel about BTCs I, in many regards. I, I'm not quite, I would think of a MELF because I, I I have my, my, uh, QFNs, my bottom terminated components I can deal with melts round part on a flat board just seems like a silly thing, but, uh, right. but yeah, the, uh, the industry's, it has been an interesting reaction. You know, then when the bottom terminates first came, all us old timers looked at it and said, Oh my goodness, the ceramic LCC has come back. Now, what are we going to do? And, you know, it's quite a different story when you start looking at the materials, but that initial reaction uh, kind of brings everybody back to, oh my goodness, BGAs. I can't see the solder joint. How are we going to do anything right? That used to be the big concern, right? No one understood how, uh, and, and that's what brought in pretty much X-ray into our, our industry. I mean, exactly. X-ray has been around for more than a hundred years, um, but it's it's been used mostly for, you know, dental and uh, <laughs> medical and other types of inspection things. And then I think... Um, uh, you know, my theory on uh, on uh, voiding is X-ray causes voiding because ah. before X-ray we had no voiding, right? So when the the electrons leave the material, they're actually leaving holes. Okay, they are. That one they I'll are. have to take back to my profs and see what they think about that. Yeah, they didn't teach you that in school, Dave. Come on, come on. What school did you go to? <laughs> well, yeah, and so, there's a lot of parallels there. You know, when BGAs came, we couldn't see the joint. Um, we had to suddenly rely on all this process control we wanted. You know, cleaning, you know, oh my goodness, now we got to clean under there. And you've been through those wars. So there's a lot of parallels to bottom terminated versus the BGAs. And we survive BGAs. We use them now. People like them. They're they're highly popular and our boards are quite dense with them. So, you know, I have confidence we'll make it through the bottom terminated um, introduction as well or its evolution. Sure. It, it is interesting the way this industry works. And probably every industry has this phenomenon where a new technology is introduced um, without any like instruction set on how to actually implement it. Right. <laughs> we don't you know, get training wheels. Here's, here you go. You know, right. if someone said um, uh, mother nature's a cruel teacher, you get the test and then you get the lesson. So exactly. Um, we, exactly. We've done that with BTCs. We've done that with BGAs. That's right. Um, I have a theory and I've, for my audience who's 
come to my uh, webinars and things like that, they're going to roll their eyes because it's like an old dad joke, you know, <laughs> told repeatedly. Um, but I have a theory about, you know, children, when you raise children, you know, you need to reinforce how much you love them. And for those unfortunate children who grew up without that reinforcement, one of two things happened. They either became sociopaths and serial killers, <laughs> or they became designers of bottom terminated components. Ah, <laughs> I, I, I could believe either back. one of those very well. They got back at society. So, um, the, the, voiding, of course, is uh, kind of the general topic of today. We, we can stray into any other direction, um, <laughs> any other, any other vice or or problem or you know uh, issues that we're having in our in our industry. But um, I was talking to a group of people the other day about voiding because in 2020 there's nothing else to do, and <laughs> and um, the, the, I've asked several of my guests this question, and, and uh, I've received uh, answers back, and I'm going to ask you the same question. Uh, is voiding overrated? And, you know, IPC has the BGA voiding spec of, you know, 30%, you know, cumulative. Um, I don't know if that number came from a tarot card or a fortune cookie or science. It came or, from or Rockwell Collins data. I will, it did? Yeah, oh, we'll my gosh. Oh, that. Absolutely. I know that history. My therapist said not to talk about it, but we'll talk about it. Anyway. <laughs> well, I'm so glad I asked you that question because the answer that um, generally I get back is, yeah, it's overrated. It's, uh, you know, it's pie in the sky. It's, it's uh, you know, rather random. Uh, so I'm, I am actually, which wouldn't surprise me, by the way, but, um, <laughs> you know, I, I'm in the cleaning business and we had a cleaning spec that was kind of chosen out of thin air, you know, oh, 35 yes. years ago, right? You know which one I'm talking about, um, which is now gone, thankfully. Um, <laughs> but um, I was curious if the same phenomenon, you know, resulted in avoiding standard or if that actually was based on science. And if it was based on science, what criteria, this is kind of, I tend to ask questions that morph into several questions all within one question. <laughs> we so, just got to remember to come back to the other side. I know, right? There, right. Yeah. yeah, it's a trail of breadcrumbs, um, which will lead me to um, what types of technology or what types of environmental um, in-use applications or what type of, of uh, reliability expectations, et cetera, would determine if a certain percentage of voiding is too high or too low. So there we go. It's a compound question. I'll well, we'll, it over to we'll you. start with parts and bounce around to the various regions. But yeah, and everything, you know, we're going to end up talking about bottom terminated, but it really does have its roots in, in BGAs. Um, one of my mentors told me that we as engineers should all have paid attention in um, sociology class because engineering is easy. People are hard. And what has happened is that we've got this brand new technology called ball good arrays. And when we got that, we said, well, we've got to see the solder joints. Well, what's the easiest way to see a solder joint? Well, we'll cross section it. Well, okay, that's great, but I can't sell the product when you're done with it, Dave. So let's go to x-ray because, um, you know, x-ray in the medical world and x-ray in the dental world. And we've done x-rays. We kind of know how to deal with that. And so we x-rayed them. And lo and behold, what did we see? We saw voids. And the first thing human reaction to something different is it's bad. No, it's different. So when we see voids, we don't know it's good. We don't know it's bad. We as an industry have to go determine that through data. And it was quite interesting when we introduced BGA criteria to the J standard 001 national standard. Um, it was set at 10% um, was in the committee. We're talking about 10%. And Les Himes had looked at that and said, well, that's awful low. And, and there were a number of people who Mike said, just like you said, hey, wait a second, voids don't really mean anything, especially a couple friends at Motorola. When Motorola was uh, king with the cell phones, they had looked at it extensively, just hadn't published the data. And so uh, Rockwell Collins and Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman and you name it, a ton of companies got together and looked at the available data and said 25%. And that's what went in. And then about six years ago, um, Rockwell Collins took a look at it. And especially, uh, as you said, there were a number of people in the industry, hey, this is, this is ridiculous. 25 is low. And so we did our test. And I, I'll remember that test quite well because I took 40 circuit boards and I ran them down our process, and which ends up being about a quarter of a million BGA solder joints. And guess how many solder joints or voids in those solder joints greater than 25% did I produce? 
right there. I counted them on one, both hands. That was it. Both ten. hands. That's it. We, ten. we x-rayed wow. every board, every part, and 10. And I'm thinking, okay, statistically, I have a problem. That, and I could dealt with that. We did another set of boards, and we teamed up with a couple people. And, and it turns out if you want to make voids, the solder paste suppliers know how. And they will give you a paste that is horrible and will produce tons of voids. My bigger problem was going back to my boss and saying, hi, I have 40 test vehicles that I can't use. Can I buy another 40? Um, I promised to use the first 40 for something else, which we did. But um, yeah, it is hard to produce voids in BGA solder joints. And we did the second round when we showed that um, you can have a void that's almost... Um, 50% of the diameter of the BGA solder balls here itself. And if it's going to fail, it's going to fail, regardless of that void. There's been this long discussion, well, a void will blunt the crack growth. Or no, the void causes the crack to grow faster. And in the end, it comes down to just good old global CT mismatch. If uh, I can take a perfectly solid, no void BGA solder joint and fail it because it's in the wrong place and the wrong design and the wrong stress. So we went through the data again, Collins, Lockheed, HP, you know, 10 or 15 companies got together, reviewed the data we had produced. We did a couple other tests and in the end, 30% went in and th it's 30% of the x-ray image area. And if you go do algebra, which my co-op did and actually saved a very embarrassing uh, math mistake in a uh, published paper, um, it that ends up being if it's 30% of the x-ray image area, that's 57% of the diameter. And so, you know, whether you're looking at it and thinking geometry or just thinking x-ray, um, very robust. And kind of like plated through whole fill, which probably something else we'll talk about today. Um, you know, if you're at that level, something's wrong. Something is seriously right. wrong. Our normal um, ball grid array voiding percentage today in our Coralville facility is 2 to 3%. You know, we've teamed up with our solder paste manufacturer. We've refined the profiles. And, they, per, you know, the, the solder paste suppliers produce some great materials. You just got to use their materials. They understand what causes voids uh, for most of it, and they know how to work that. So, so what happens when we get to QFNs? We x-ray them, and in that thermal pad, which you'll hear me call the belly pad, and the, uh, the I.O. pads I call the fence, because to me, I, and you know this better than I do, trying to get cleaning solution past that fence to get in yeah. that other area is like, I, to me, I think it's impossible. I don't know how you do it. I just It's amazing what, what the cleaning chemistry is designed and the equipment designed, how we even come close to doing that. The same thing, we looked at the belly pad. Oh, there's voids there. Oh, these are bad. And there's a twist to that. So when ball grid arrays, the voids, the only thing that void really related to was the solder joint integrity. QFN, right. yeah, QFNs came into being for two reasons. One, I want electrical functionality. I can push signal grounding through that belly pad. I can dump heat through that belly pad. It isn't just how good is the solder joint. There's functional needs. And that's where we got all wrapped up. That's why the industry has been, you know, you don't hear the industry talk about BGA voids anymore. We don't. We 30%, everyone hits it. But boy, the discussion in the committees about QFN or B, BTC voiding, that's been the latest craze. In this last, this recent revision in the national standard, we finally separated it. If you need a certain percentage of solder coverage on the belly pad, that's a design attribute. And I, you know, I should do that up front. I, as the assembler, I can't help you at that point. You just got to tell me what you need and whether I get it or not. And we did the work last year. It was published last year. Um, you can have up to 50% and the automotive industry actually believes greater, but our data only supported up to 50% um, voiding and you won't affect the solder joint integrity of that part at all. So now we're going to see the industry kind of work that way. Is it greater? Can it be, you know, 30% coverage and 70% non-wetting. And we'll, and I think more importantly, we've separated functionality from solder joint integrity. Two topics need tackled two different ways. So it's, um, it's interesting, the amount of, at least the industry is, the experts are leaning toward a higher percentage of voiding, allowable voiding for that belly pad, as, as, as you call it, uh, compared to BTCs. Um, did that 
but there's not a standard on that yet, right? That's still in like committee in the talking stages. I know there's you know there's the thirty percent standard for for BGAs. Is there a published standard or uh, understanding at least? Yeah, for, with, uh, with Rev H of the of the national standard, um, it is a it is uh, either you you do it by AA bus agreement between vendor and user. It was put into the uh, chapter seven for BTCs for the belly pad. 50% minimum is a process indicator. Now what will happen is that 50% instead of being a process indicator, it'll just turn into a default standard for the short term. The automotive folks um, talking with our friends at Continental and Bosch, mm -hmm. um, they are producing data um, that will probably, uh, the next rev of the specification could take it from, I need 50% wetting to 30% wetting. Um, that's just our data. That's all the farther um, I could get the process to go. Kind of like BGAs. If I wanted to make bigger voids, I was having trouble doing it. And so, you know, hitting 50% minimum should not be an issue for anybody. If a good, well-designed, in-control process teamed up with a solder paste supplier who's giving you good materials, teamed up with your stencil manufacturer, um, hitting 50% minimum, uh, I, I hope this goes the same way BGAs did. I hope that we stop talking about that and mm -hmm. go on to more important topics for our industry. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Let me ask you on, um, I agree, and then we're going to keep talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, when, when whatever percentage uh, was agreed upon, was that only a concern about about the intermetallic bond strength, you know, the solder uh, integrity? Did it take into account uh, thermal dissipation? No. So the, the work that we presented to committee last year and was accepted was strictly and only solder joint integrity. What so keeps that it FH, part on the board? And we cycled minus 55 to plus 125, which is the avionics. I, I come out of producing things for airplanes. So you're going to right. fall back to the avionics world rather than the handhelds or space or one of our other market segments. But that's minus 55 to 125 is a pretty big range. We went 3,000 thermal cycles. We kept the stuff in the chamber. In fact, we broke the chamber. It took a year and a half and the chamber broke. <laughs> we said, okay, we're done because I need to pull it all out of the chamber. 3,000 thermal cycles. In the, if you look at the Weibel distributions and the N63 and the Weibel characteristics, you know the solder joints have N63 values north of a thousand cycles, which is well above what most people need in their designs. So our, our, our quest, our objective of that test, what do you need for the solder joint? Because I have my design teams telling me, oh, I need a certain amount for thermal dissipation or for grounding. So if you need that functionality, and that's where the standard was very comfortable. That's a design attribute. You do that up front as part of your planning. When I send my board to Hillman's contract shop and he's soldering them, I don't know what the design attributes of the part is. I just know what the solder is supposed to be. So if it's something better than 50% for solder joint integrity, put it on the drawing. Tell me this part is special and I need to do something different. And we can do that. We see that all the time on drawings. Oh, this part needs a certain amount of wetting or needs certain fillets or you need to do this because it's necessary for the part, not exactly necessary for its integrity. Right. So let we, you talked about cleaning a little earlier. Um, one of the challenges we face in the cleaning industry is of course, getting under these fine pitch components and that good luck. That's with been, that. well, it's an ongoing, <laughs> it's an ongoing battle as, as, as the component continues to drop, you know, closer to the board. Um, but, we, we managed to do it to acceptable levels between the, the, the marvels of chemical and then uh, <laughs> in the wash process, which they cheat because they can lower the surface tension. You know, they can make skinnier water. Um, <laughs> the rinse process is where the equipment has to earn its stripes because we can't add a chemical to lower the surface tension in the rinse. Because you're trying to rinse. <laughs> we, we're trying to rinse, right. We're, we, so, you know, that's just sure mechanical brute strength and water particle size and impact pressures and you know, all those tricks of the trade. Um, but one of the, in the world of no clean and, uh, and I'll, you know, overly simple, uh, make this simple, uh, for my own edification, my, my own good, um, no clean works primarily by, um, during the reflow process, burning out all the bad actors, the activators and things like that. And then encapsulating some of those 
bad actors. Um, so in a resin rosin layer, uh, which itself is benign, non-conductive, uh, and it, it's basically you know little rosin resin jails for all the bad actors that are conductive, bad, yeah. corrosive, right? So when the thermal uh, peak temperatures and the and the profile are performed properly uh, to the solder paste specification, everything is cool. All the bad actors kind of disappear. The the flux residues are largely invisible and and pretty pretty benign. Uh, and, and the world is good, right? The sun rises again the next day. On My experience tells me that the same phenomenon that causes voiding, uh, which could cause, depending on the amount of voiding, um, solderability issues, you know, the, the integrity issues, it could cause uh, heat dissipation issues. What a lot of people don't draw the line to, so there's, a, there's a third um, issue, and that is uh, the, what's causing those voids in many cases is entrapped gases, uh, fluxes, and, and, and they can't outgas, they can't escape, so they kind of push the solder around and, and, and prevent it from wetting to that particular area. And what's left after reflow is quite frequently unactivated um, flux activators under the component, which, will, um, keep, which can be problematic. Um, and, yeah, those, and those gases are supposed to leave. <laughs> they're supposed to go away. <laughs> they were but they're supposed to stay around. under there and camp mm. out. Right, right. It's like a it's like a house guest at Thanksgiving that won't leave by <laughs> Christmas. You know, it's just, they're still here. So, um, so that's quite problematic. Now, it's not problematic if you're running a flux that you're intending on cleaning, because then you know you, all you have is the the challenge of getting under the component. Um, yeah, but if all, one of, just that, that's all. That's it. Yes. <laughs> Day in a park for us. But <laughs> I tell but, you, uh, I'm more scared about BTCs because, you know, BGAs, you know, what you and your colleagues in the cleaning world for our industry do is just I, chemistry. Metallurgy is easy. Chemistry is this black art. I don't know how you guys do it some days. Um, but with BGAs, you know, the largest BGA we have in the factory night right now is 2,600 IO. It is almost three inches square. Wow. I don't know how anybody gets anything, you know, and we've, we pulled them off and looked at them. And the reality is no matter how well you clean, there's always a little bit of residue. And so it kind of goes back to what you said. It's this partnership of your process, the material you're using and what you're going to, I'm always going to leave a little residue someplace and that residue better be fine. And with BGAs, I wasn't too worried it's right around the pad. It's not bridging anything. When we looked at QFNs and Dave Adams, um, and you know, Dave, he's sure. was our cleaning guru before he retired he came and I soldered uh, our first test boards down and, and he looked at him and said, you know, that's a three mil gap. And I said, is that a problem? And he said, yeah, this might be. And so we spent considerable time. How do you get a fluid under a three mil gap? And then I have this fence and it isn't these isolated spheres in a nice array that I can, you know, do solution from an X or a Y direction. I, 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 I am more worried. I'm, I've, never been worried about the solder joint integrity once we did the initial test it's the mm -hmm. cleaning and, and yeah. you're right it, because we clean if we do a half bad job i was gonna say half ass and i'm still gonna say half ass job of cleaning that's it, a that's it, an ipc it, term I, yeah you proved it's bad we're all on the half ass know? committee yeah <laughs> <laughs> and so i would be in many many cases both you and your colleagues have proven leave it alone you don't trust yeah. your chemistry when we start to fiddle uh, and, and so, yeah, we've, I think we've asked you to do the impossible job. You know, I want a material that I want to clean out of there when, why not I just leave it alone? And so, yeah, that's my bigger, you bring up the bigger voids, who cares about voids? It's cleaning under there for the environment I'm supposed to be in. Right. And the point I was making is the voids, I agree, who cares about the voids? You know, you guys have <laughs> done your, no, you guys have done your work to know what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. And if anyone can do that right, it's, it, you know, Rockwell Collins, um, but what what the the problem is is the more voiding, the more residue that's under there. So yep. you could, if your plan was to run no clean and not clean it, uh, which is probably not real common in the avionics world and military and space and all that and medical, they tend to clean things. Um, but if you're running a you know commercial application that for no other reason needs to be cleaned, and you have voiding and you're running no clean, I can guarantee you you need to clean that. Yeah. Even though you're running no clean, because we did not give the no clean a chance to um, completely outgas the activators and and encapsulate them. So 
Um, no clean is no longer a no clean <laughs> if there's voiding below a BGA or a below a, 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 a BTC. And, and when going back to your um, your fence analogy yeah. on BGAs, I, I uh, liken it to bowling. So, you know, anyone who's gone to a 10-pin bowling alley will know, you know there's 10 pins there. And a bowling ball can, if you get it just right, it, you can knock down all 10 pins. Now imagine if they came up with like a super bowling that had a hundred pins, right? Oh, this is going to get no, thank you. You're not, there's no angle that will get all hundred pins knocked down. And that's what these, these three inch BGAs are. They're a bowling alley with a hundred pins and a, and, and a smaller bowling ball, you know, like, a, oh, like yeah. a, like well, a pool, then, then like I give you ball. a bottom turn and not only do I give you one fence, let's put us two rows, let's put two fences under there and let's offset them. Um, yes, I, it, it is a great component. It is QF bottom terminated parts. You know, I say QFN quite a bit because that's just the slang term for them these days. But BTCs are great. They are highly reliable. The design community has lots of functions, but when you look at them, it is probably the the hardest cleaning challenge we have ever had. It's the hardest printing challenge. Um, we're really good at single fences. I can deal with two fences as long as it's 0.5 millimeter pitched, a few 0.4. Um, we don't we don't process three row three fence QFNs. I can't print it. I can I have yet to figure out and and there are some people in the industry that have. How do you print paste on the belly pad and then get paste on three rows of fences and they all have the right buoyancy to nobody dances the wrong way in bridges? Um, right. I gave up. I, we can't do it. And so we do two rows and three row or one row and two row and we just don't allow three row. And luckily there's not a lot of demand for the functionality of what a three row does. And I, I just look at three row and said, okay, no clean because there, how am I, I'll never clean it. I'll never get in there. I don't know how you get under single row, let alone two fences. Right. From a printing standpoint, is that challenge, that three row challenge, um, a stencil challenge? W would that be something uh, jetting could overcome? Yeah. And a lot of people that forget about jetting. the throughput. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're seeing QFNs and along with now come along the O201s or as our good fr uh, friend, Doug Pauls would say the O10 halves, because we're not going to say O05. <laughs> so the O10 yeah. halves are, um, I kind of believe with O201s, you sprinkle them on the board, you solder it, and then you shake it and whatever falls off. Those are the ones that didn't solder. I don't even know how you see these things. I know that, um, someone said, how are we going to clean them? And I said, well, the good news is you're not putting down a lot of paste to, with a residue that needs cleaned off. So be thankful for that. But yeah, the boards tend to be um, higher complexity, smaller size. So you're lucky you can use a three mil stencil or a four mil stencil with a, a nice coating, a, a slick coating that allows better release. Um, but yeah, you're fighting, you know, that center pad is a large solder volume and the fences are smaller solder, solder volumes. And you're just playing with that buoyancy of, okay, what's gonna float it around? Um, and to make your job even worse, you know, remember when BTCs all had uniform pads and spacing? Let's just mess them around where now the, the, sure. the uniformity is gone. I mean, they'll have big pads, little pads, all danced. Uh, there's no clear clean, you know, I like your bowling alley. I can't throw a bowling ball down underneath the uh, BTC anymore because I keep right. hitting all sorts of pads. Sure. So again, parents, reinforce <laughs> the love for your children every chance you get, or they're going to come up with worse components. Uh, one of the challenges in cleaning is, uh, you know, we, we direct fluid out of a nozzle and it heads toward the target. Um, once, that, once it ricochets off that target, it loses about 80% of its, of its energy. Oh, wow. Um, so, you know, imagine a water cannon uh, in, a, in a riot – it's not hard. It's not too hard to imagine these Seen days. Seen a few of those this year. Yes, exactly. So, so you know, the water cannon hits uh, protester one, and knocks that protester back twelve feet. Water from that protester splashes off the pro, uh, a protester, hits the person next to them, and they just get wet. You know, they're not knocked down. It, it once water ricochets, it loses the majority of its energy. Now, apply that to BGAs. So, a fluid has to enter the first set of obstacles and that it's hitting with uh, you know one degree of separation you know or zero degree of separation then it bounces off and hits the the one behind it you know, second degree of of separation and next thing you know you have you know uh, 20 <laughs> degrees of separation and and the, and the parts are barely perspiring you know uh, much less getting uh, high impact 
the fluids. So that is not so much a well, part of it lies on the cleaning machine, but that that is a the ability to clean multiple row BGAs uh, is a testament to the chemical companies because for particularly aqueous processes to work, not talking solvents now, because solvents are rarely used in production anymore. It's mostly aqueous. Um, the, the, um, the interaction between the, the wash solution, which is water and chemical, and the target has to have an exchange of energy, not just contact. Solvent was contact. Just dunk it and it'll, it'll dissolve. We're not dissolving things anymore. We're, we're, we're bringing things into solution through the exchange of contact, heat, time, energy. And the amount of energy is really important to force that either saponification process or you know, solubilization process to take effect. And as we lose that energy every time, you know, it, like a pinball machine, every time the water bounces off another ball to another ball to another ball, um, that puts the um, responsibility on still having enough energy to clean the part on the chemical company. They now have to clean with less energy uh, than they oh, used yeah. to because um, we're not cleaning a one-dimensional part anymore. You know, this is this is the matrix of, of, of components here. So um, it, it does put a lot of, a lot of uh, pressure on the chemical companies to be able to force that solubilization process uh, or saponification process to take effect uh, with less and less energy compared to older chemicals, which... You know, we didn't have to worry about those those uh, obstacle courses at, at the time. Well, and you you know, think of a, Q, a BTC as a BGA on steroids, <clears throat> and we started out where you know they're six by six and four by four and five by five millimeters. They're fairly small, and and you know we were able to, cleaning was pretty well. Well, now like well if, if it's really good, let's make them bigger. So I'm starting to see a trend from our design teams of 10 by 10, 12 by 12. QFNs, BGCs are getting bigger, and which means all those troubles are just going to get magnified. Um, I got to believe the limiting, the limiting technology for BTCs won't be the soldering. I think I can always solder them. What do I do in the cleaning? How do I deal with the residues? What are my corrosion concerns for that product use environment? That's the bad part. Uh, there, I've got a feeling there will be like any part, you can find the wrong environment with the wrong process and it will, the board will corrode. No matter what we do, we can't stop it. And that's where the, the conformal coating materials, the perilines in the world come in and try to save us. But uh, yeah, if, if BTC start this trend of 10 by 10 millimeter, 12 by 12, 14 by 14, um, I think there's a limit. I think we're going to find a limit where if you are not um, doing no clean, you maybe need to think, like you said, go to jetting. Let's do something very precision with the amount of paste rather than stencils a great, great technology, but it puts down large blocks of material. Maybe we need to tailor that. And I think maybe that's why you see the, the jetting equipment, um, not just for the O201s, but other technologies. We found where, hey, having that precision, that's a cool thing. Maybe we can use that to our advantage in other uh, cases, other situations, other part technologies. Yeah, very good. It it seems to me the mitigation to voiding is to, you know, basically raise the bridge or lower the water. One of the two <laughs> or both. Right? As a kayaker, I like the bridge going up. That makes yes. me a lot more yes. happy because I know exactly. what happens if the water goes up and the bridge stays put. That's right. That's right. Then then you, you, you get scraped your out head. of your boat and it's not pleasant. No, I, I can imagine that. So uh, I've heard and 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 allowing outgassing channels, uh, window painting, uh, things yep. like that. So there are a lot of mechanical tricks, uh, building uh, dams, bringing the mask down or, or expanding the, uh, opening up the mask area um, or raising the mask area to, to get more clearance underneath. All of these are mechanical tricks. Are, do those, in your, in your experience, do those techniques have merit? Are there other techniques that are being worked on uh, that are publishable that would also mitigate uh, the, um, the avoiding concerns? That's actually a really good thing to bring up. Um, number one, first and foremost, it's your paste. You know, we learned that in BGAs. We're seeing that in BTCs. Your solder paste, it's composition, it's chemistry. Um, that determines voiding. 
you know, the reflow profile plays a role and there's other things playing, you know, the surface finish um, goal, is it tin, is it immersion silver? But first and foremost, the top of the Pareto chart, I've got to have a pace that's low voiding, it's great characteristics. But then it bounces into something interesting and that's that design and uh, put a plug in for the IPC 7095 committee. Um, that is the, um, no, I'm sorry, 7093 committee. Um, that is the BTC design guidelines. And Matt Kelly and Udo um, Weitz from, uh, Matt's now with IPC and Udo's from, um, oh heavens, um, one of the automotive guys. They came in and that specification is out now. Tremendous amount of re, um, revision and exactly at the item you talked about. How do I print paste? What patterns do I print paste? What do I do with the microvias and how do they interact with creation or, um, you know, aiding void, making voids or stopping voids? Um, what do you do with the different solder mask uh, areas? There's one they call striping. I call it zebra striping, where instead of doing blocks of mask, just think of the belly pad having stripes of solder mask of a certain width to allow channels for all that gas to go away. And like you said, if it's not trapped under there, it's not going to cause me a problem. So the, the 7093 specification has two whole brand new, completely revised chapters with the latest and greatest solder mask and microvia technologies to aid in what we do in, in getting those um, the, the voids out of there. I mean, I'm an old time engineer. It's easy. Cap the darn vias. If you're gonna put a micro V in there, just plate it shut, fill it and plate it shut. And of course, my my buddies in the fabrication industry say, Oh, you just dumped your problem on us. And I said, Yeah, I did, because if it happens up front, I don't worry about it toward the end. But yeah, exactly. What am I doing with vias? What am I doing with solder mask? Um, huge advantage down with the new specification and new ideas on how to deal with that. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, th this is an industry of of past the problem. You know, you've heard the old <laughs> game of telephone that kids play. You oh, know, yes. And ours is like here, you know, or maybe a better analogy is like a hot potato, you know, <laughs> past the hot <laughs> potato, the hot component to, to other things, to, to the next uh, next group in the assembly line. So we, you know, BGAs were historically the poster child of problem components and now you know now we wish all we had were bgas because btcs are <laughs> those you know, are easy qfns and other types of components are now um you know the the poster child of of uh trouble components what else out there uh gives our industry trouble particularly from a metallurgical point of view um, well you, you know that i always love what my mentor said let's go solve all the problems we don't know yet Oh, wait a second. What? <laughs> uh, yeah. And so you, we can't, we don't know what's coming and, and some, you know, bright young man or woman will come up with some neat stuff. But I think what's probably on our short term horizon, you mentioned earlier, x-ray. We now have a non-destructive technique that sees all kinds of stuff. So there are people that have, you know, well, you know, I, I go to the doctor and I get a CAT scan. I go to the dentist and I get an x-ray. Somewhere along the line, someone says, how many REMS have you had for the year? Because there's a certain amount of x-ray exposure and our boards are no different. And, you know, there's some pretty good guidelines right now. The IPC national standard, J001, has taken that first step. And how do we carefully, gradually, with thought, introduce rules and requirements around x-ray? But, you know, we'd, I'd said it earlier. So I x-ray a board. And I see things that are different. Well, you know, we had plated through holes longer than you and I've been in the industry. And sure enough, what do we see in those plated through hole? Voids. Are they bad? Are they good? And so the next real big push, now once we kind of get comfortable with where the BTC world is setting, is what do you do with the voids in through hole components? Are they bad? You know, most of them have been there for a long time. We didn't have the analysis tools to tell us that. Are they bad? Are they good? You know, we've used 75% for a long time. Uh, Jim Reed and Les Himes, my mentors at IPC and the committees, always stuck to, you know, 75% is where you should go. But our boards are getting thicker. They're getting a lot more copper. It's harder to solder. You know, if I can't change the process, gee, I'll go question the requirement. Let's see why the requirements are. It's 75 the right number. But now we have a tool. Should we be saying, you know, a lot of people have said for a long time, 50% is good enough for many, many products. Maybe it's good enough for more products than we think. So I think that's that next step. We're going to understand what x-ray is showing me. 
Um, and, and is that good or is that bad? And what do we need to adjust our, either adjust our standards or adjust our processes? Because I know every time we change the standard, it costs the industry money. Changing standards is done based on data. And that's why I have to laugh. There was a magazine article that said, the IPC standards are getting squishier and squishier. Um, so we applied 25% voiding to all the components on our board. And I'm thinking, that's great. I don't know if you actually needed it and you may have cost yourself money. So the national standards change for one reason. It's that we have data that says this is the right direction to go. And so I think that's that next uh, next step. What are you going to do about voids? What about in surface mount resistors? You know, I never saw them. They're there. We actually are bored. You're going like, wow, I didn't think we had that many. And each component type, like you described cleaning, the soldering is a little different. And whether it's going to void or not void is a lot to do with that component type and its configuration. So I think our next hurdle is understanding how we apply, apply X-ray smartly and how X-ray you know, where do you draw the line so we don't go too far, where we're, we're actually, the cure is worse than the disease. We're reworking things when we shouldn't be. Right. I, I um, spoke with um, one of my guests, I, I'm trying to remember who it was, and his basic, I think it was Phil Zaro, actually, um, and his basic rule of thumb is no rework. Yeah. <laughs> if, you know, if something looks kind of sloppy, the, the, the art of rework puts the part in more jeopardy than just leaving it the way it is. If even if it's a slight solder defect, it's not coming off the board. Um, if it doesn't quite meet the standard, it's probably more dangerous to rework it and subject the entire board to, you know, spot cleaning or, or, or whatever more handling than it is to just leave it the way it is. Um, I, I used to fly airplanes and there was a philosophy we called the big sky rule. And that was, if it looked like we were going to hit another plane in the sky, the, the best action is not to do anything uh, because changing your attitude, you know, you might act, take up more airspace if you, if you try and, you know, move out of the person's way. And the chances of hitting are very, very remote. You know, it, it happens, but it's extremely rare. Um, usually it's best to just, you know, I don't know. Close, I don't think they ever said this, but Hold close your eyes and take your hands off the wheel. <laughs> right. Just, just don't increase your profile, you know, your space profile. So I, the same probably applies to a certain degree, to uh, to what we're talking about. Oh, the number I of think... times Dave Adams has chewed on me because I reworked something. And if you thought the <laughs> residue just coming out of the normal process was good, I know you've seen rework residues. And they're, you know, oh, sure. they're caramelized, they're cooked. They, oh, they're they much harder. Like, oh, yeah. And, and now I expect you to get those off for me. So, yeah, right. why even deal with the whole thing? I'm with Phil. It's just, hey, don't rework. You know, figure out that, hey, maybe that's okay just to leave it alone. Yeah. Uh, personally, from a completely selfish business standpoint, you know, I, I'm, I'm for voiding because, you know, let the standard go to 90% voids. That's great because the more, uh, the, the more voiding, the, the more uh, likely uh, problematic residues are going to be underneath in that void. So, you know, it, uh, it, it, I think the, the drive on coming up with a acceptable voiding number probably didn't take too much consideration into, you know, what's inside that void. You know, it's zero. It, in many cases, it's not a void. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not empty. It, it has flux residues and, and activators and things like that in there. Um, it, it's not necessarily dry, which is great for our industry. Because That's that a hot potato. Here you go. It. Oh, I, I, my solder joints, fat, dumb, and happy. You know, there's yep. these weak organic acids and copper. I don't know if that's a bad combination, but I'll leave that to you to deal with, you know, how that goes through. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and we did. I, again, we the, the research we did last year, the investigation was to solve one piece of that recipe and to say, okay, here's where you're at with its solder joint integrity. There, You know, like anything in our industry, those equations don't have one factor. There's too many other things, you know, like you said, um, how do I put vias and, and solder mass down to aid that versus, okay, I'm just going to completely 100% rely on my cleaning equipment and chemistry to save me. And it can't, we just, it's too complex. It's got to be, um, one of the guys here called it an ecosystem. And if you look at our soldering process, Lord. it is an ecosystem. How do I control a print? What's my reflow? Um, how do I clean? What was the design? And one of those gets out of whack just like in our normal world around us, um, things start to be suboptimal. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, absolutely. So 
you come from a metallurgical background. Uh, what other metallurgical um, monsters are out, you know, uh, threatening our boards? Lead free. Uh, I mean, isn't that the the topic of the world is lead free? I'm I'm hoping that it goes. I'll be retired before it does go away. I know that. But it is interesting. You know, we spent 60 years using one material. And now people say, oh, we got to go change the drawing notes and, and we need to put symbols on everything. And I, I kind of sat back and say, so when you were reworking a board, you didn't look down at the drawing? Oh, what do you mean? I had to pull the drawing? We've had one material set so well established that we got lazy. Right. You know, we I don't got to yeah. look at stuff. And now, you know, and so we've been doing lead-free soldering at, at Collins Aerospace now for about 10 years. Um, well-developed material set using SAC 305. But we did do one consolation. And the solder mask on the lid-free boards are blue. It goes back to, to human behavior again. Yeah, I could look at the drawing and I got everything set right. But when I get a blue board in front of me, I don't have to think, oh, blue, lead-free. What do I do? And I, all the processes fall into place. So lead-free is, is where we're going. We have... The commercial world's done a great job. Um, they've established the alloys, um, but what you're finding now is, is the class three, the avionics, military, medical space. As we start to explore that space, um, we're wanting alloys that are better. You know, SAC 305, in general, the industry consensus is in low stress environments, it beats tin lead. In high stress environments, it loses a tin lead. But in many of those cases, it's good enough. It, will, it, will, it won't do as well as tin lead did. But do I need something on the B-52 for the next 97 years? No. Um, we can replace things and, and do other things. Um, but parts of the industry, the automotive guys have been doing lead-free now for quite a while. And you see a drive for them. I want something better than SAC 305. And, what, of course, the metallurgists are going, yeah, there's a periodic table behind me. There's all sorts of elements on that periodic table. And we're seeing the big drive that they've taken SAC 305. And they've got down to putting bismuth, antimony, and indium. Those are three elements that are readily available. They understand the reactions. And we are now finding those combinations through the different consortia like CALS, HD Pug, um, the Cave Guys, just all the different um, folks, uh, INEMI. They're looking at all these new alloys and they're going, hey, these are better than 305. So I, I and again, the parallels are crazy. What happens when they told you Freon has got to go away, Mike? Freon is gone. Montreal Protocol is here. We're not using Freon. It led no to new cleaning it. systems. It led to new low residue. You know, our whole technology right. improved because we were forced to. And I think lead free is going to cause that. We are going to find an alloy that was better than tin lead. And it will cause us to change. Um, you know, tin lead was beautiful. It went on and off like a light switch. It went from a liquid to a solid at one temperature called eutectic. Eutectic, yeah. Yeah. T lead freeze will never have that. We're always going to have a small pasty range. We're going to have shrinkage voids, but we can deal with it. We're, we're engineers. Let's go solve the problem. See, I expect 10 years from now, people will just kind of, you know, you remember when, oh, we're going to get rid of Freon. The world is coming to an end. You thought some of the those magazines. drowning puppies, you know, don't do oh. this, please. <laughs> Remember the magazines back in the day we had actually print magazines, you know, <laughs> before the internet um, on the, uh, I think circuits assembly, EPMP, um, whatever the other ones were uh, at the time were, were publishing on their front cover 12 months to the Montreal protocol, then 11 months to the Montreal protocol. And it was uh, the conventional wisdom at the time was that the U S and, and the Western nations would be third world countries when it comes to, <laughs> Uh, production because only the third world countries will be able to continue production. So we'll, we'll just basically hand the key over to prosperity over to these other countries. And I mean, it was doom and gloom. It would, I think for, for the younger engineers that, that are listening to this program, it would be analogous to tomorrow. The EPA announces that in um, 12 months, they're going to ban gasoline. Yep. All going away. No more. All going away. It would A, create a panic. <laughs> B, it would create a sense of denial. Like, oh, it won't happen. It won't happen. Yeah. It, it, they'll bail out of it, you know. But this was a 10-year phase out. And uh, and solvents in those days were just, they were so integrated into our, our processes. Pretty much every board was cleaned, except there's one set of boards that were never cleaned. Those were television sets. 
they they would they would just leave the rosin flux as high solids rosin flux on the boards as a kind of a poor man's conformal coating, right? Yep. Um, but outside of that type of stuff, everything was clean back then. So, what other? Uh, this is a, a, a kind of a detour in our last few minutes to a slightly different, well, completely different topic, but it involves, <laughs> it involves corrosion. It involves uh, uh, metallurgical stuff, uh, reactions <laughs> that I find quite fascinating, and that's creep corrosion. Yep. Uh, have we, has our industry got a handle on that? Are they understanding uh, the relationship between environmental uh, uh, atmospheric stuff like sulfur and whatever in the air that certain countries are known to have, you know, uh, in abundance, uh, and and a reaction on a board. Have have we have we learned our lessons on that, or is that still? It's like everything. I think we have. I mean, you know, uh, I love immersion silver. I think immersion silver is a wonderful it's flat and it's reactive and my RF, which stands for really freaky, not radio frequency. The RF <laughs> designers think that it's great and, and all that, but we found, Hey, you can't, you know, we went away from tin lead, nothing solders like solder. And we started putting gold and tin and silver in environments a little ahead of maybe we should have. And there are like anything, there are certain environments, certain materials just can't handle. They just, they're going to react. And creep corrosion was interesting. And I always remember, because what I was taught in school, to have a battery, you need three things. I need current, I need an ionic source, I need electrolyte. And it's a three-legged stool. I break one of those legs and I won't have corrosion. And the first few things on creep corrosion was there's, there's no electrolyte. And so, no, wait a second. Well, there is electrolyte and it's a mono layer of moisture or water or something on the surface. Even creep corrosion follows the basic tenets of corrosion activity. Um, mm -hmm. But we've learned what combinations, you know, it was real interesting, you know, it, different parts of the world, gee, act differently. And in a couple parts of the world where they had built over the top of landfills and the landfills were emitting gases, well, it goes up into your ventilation system and goes across your refractory and no wonder things corrode. Maybe we need to treat it differently. Conformal coat, you know, I expect maybe in, um, the next kind of things, where are we going with conformal coat? We've, the nano coats seem to offer some different things. So um, yeah, creep corrosion, we've got our hands on. I don't think we fully understand um, dendritic growth. As things are getting smaller, the only things I think saving us is we went from five volts to three, three to one, one. We're, we're lowering down that energy needed to, to drive a dendrite growth. But there are, we're going to hit some spacing where suddenly the old rules are going to have to be challenged. And that's where the mm -hmm. younger crowd can come in. What can they do in materials, in design, changing solder mask? You know, BGAs, we don't do solder mask to find pads. O201s, I do, because I can't get rid of the mask well enough. I have to laser ablate and open up those pads. And wow, they work. And I, you know, everyone says, oh, the solder joint on 0201 is going to die. Nope. S size matters. So by going smaller, where physics didn't change, I mean, Doug, Doug Paul says the wand of physics, and we have get to use it. So um, we still got to do what we learned in school. <laughs> but yeah, I expect this next generation, tackle, the, tackle how size is impacting what we do. And, you know, we spent a lot of this, this uh, telecast here talking about the slow gap size in QFNs. Other things on size are going to creep in, and we're going to need young minds to go tackle that and figure out solutions for that. Yes, and I, I, I finally see – Doug and I talked about this, actually. Uh, we talked about that, you know, silver tsunami effect uh, <sighs> where, you know, I, I put Doug into that category. And I'm and in that category. Which, oh, yeah. Well, well, with silver, but <laughs> they're not old enough to be – you're not walking out that door any, <laughs> any minute. But there's a, there are a lot of um, very experienced, very wise sages out there implanted in companies. You're one of them um, for, for a, a, a um, subject matter expert. Uh, Doug is obviously one. Every, many companies have their subject matter experts that are the go-to you know, for the entire organization. Um, and as those people leave, they may or may not – more frequently may not be replaced for, you know, with another subject matter expert uh, who's got the same stature and experience as the, uh, as their predecessor. So um, that, that is, I think, problematic. And we've talked about it several times on the show. That's, I think, problematic for the industry because then industry starts relying on vendors who have a horse in a race, you know, to, to provide, 
what may be perfectly sound advice, it, it may be skewed, it may be, um, you know, one-sided, but it, but it still could be good advice. But, but um, the, the act of, of, of these people leaving was really concerning uh, for two reasons. One that I just mentioned, the, the, the knowledge drain, uh, and the other is uh, who's taking their place or who's coming in on the lower ranks to work, to work up to that future level. I'm now seeing, once I started complaining about it, that it I actually started noticing. So I don't know if you know, I solved the problem, um, or, or or once you talk about it, you, you know, once you, once you think about buying a red car, all you see are red cars, yep. right? So <laughs> it may be it may be that, but I am seeing a um, a growth in young blood coming into our industry. I agree. Uh, you is, know, IPC and great. SMTA both are great programs. They're they're yes. pushing. Um, I I had mentors. You know, I had people that guided me. I could go ask a question. Um, I always laughed because we had a in way back when none of our current people. We had a couple of VPs that said, "We'll just be a design house," and and you learn real fast if you're not getting your elbows dirty, if you're not working, you're not building, you're not talking with your suppliers, you quickly become irrelevant. You're just you, your knowledge is tied to a book. And while if you could see the other parts of my office, I've got a lot of textbooks. It's the electronics age, and that stuff is there. But you know, just because I saw it on Google doesn't mean it's true. And like, you know, there's things on really? Google that funny, they're skewed a few ways. And so we still need wow. that mentorship. We still need those those youngsters, those kids as they come up to have access to people, and then they in turn will pay back. And it, it, it always happens. I mean, I've I've my mentors helped me. I've made a point to pay back to the people I can, and I think our industry does that well. So I'm glad you're seeing it. I'm seeing it a little bit, maybe not as much as I'd like, but yeah, uh, we need that next generation to come in because the problems aren't going away and they're going to get tougher. You know, how do we deal with environmental stuff and yet still have material sets that are robust? And so it's going to take engineering's easy. People are hard. We'll, we'll get to some of them good people in to help us out. Yeah, I think sometimes we as where both are hard, people yeah. and engineering, <laughs> right? Um, but we, but we were our industry in mass, you know, smart people, you know, by nature. So, so uh, I, I think we do find our way out of these these uh, these challenging um, issues like BTCs and whatever the next challenging issue is going to be. And speaking of mentoring, uh, you have been um, uh, a great resource for our industry. Thank you. Uh, I've sat through many of your papers. Uh, one thing our industry suffers from are exciting speakers, and you and and uh, Doug both, uh, Doug Pauls both are uh, basically you break the rules. Um, a little so bit. Yeah. <laughs> it's really hard to get you know a group of you know 150 200 engin engineers you know laughing you know at stuff that the I haven't quite figured out where their sense of humor lies, but you guys have, <laughs> and um, it, it's hard enough to sit through you know, technical stuff and, you know, you know, go into the weeds and stuff like that. So uh, you guys both have the uh, unique ability, uh, unique particularly within our industry, to make it um, uh, more entertaining because uh, why not throw a few really bad dad jokes in there? Like, <laughs> well, thank you. you. I, 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 that's why I always go to your presentations because you are, you are very entertaining and it, it's – it's one of the things my men, and that, I guess I'd push that to your audience too, is is that um, when I started, many when mammoths roamed the earth, as Doug would <laughs> right. say, well, many years back, um, I couldn't stand in front of an audience to save my soul. And so I've taken three presentation classes. I took everything that Collins Aerospace had. I took a um, Toastmasters. I took a couple things outside, and I've learned that um, I don't like podiums. You know, podiums. I, I have to wander. You learn your I speaking wandered. style. Um, yes. the beauty is I always used to have a pen in my hand. In fact, right now I have something in my hand because I have to do something with my hands when I am talking to yeah. an audience and stuff. So you learn what you need to be comfortable. And then the other thing is know your stuff. You know, you, you can tell when a speaker really understands right. what they did, they're passionate about it. Um, right. that would be rule number two. If you don't know your material, the hardest thing, and I saw you do this once and I was just amazed, pick up another presenter's work because they're gone and the audience. So we're not going to skip that presentation. And there was a conference you picked it up at one of the conferences and I don't know how you did it, but you still made it entertaining. That's hard to do. So you've got to know your material. And the last one is 
don't be afraid to poke fun at yourself. You know, we're oh, engineer. Yeah. Our jobs are hard. Our jobs are stressful. Um, Doug started it and I've continued it. And luckily our management's supported it. But you'll notice that at the end of every one of my presentations, there's a funny cell. When it says questions, there's some kind of weird, strange, most of the time politically correct cell there that's like, okay, you know, let's have some fun. And so I think I'm not one on the automation. You, when you do automation, it's cool. And I think pictures, you know, it's called presentation. And we're constantly telling our young engineers, you may want to put down 50 sentences on that first PowerPoint cell. Do it. But then when you're done, I want to cook down to 10 or five. Present right. to me and, and know your material. Use good pictures. So um, work at it. And, and it's fun. I enjoy presenting. Maybe that's why um, people like coming to my presentations. But I think if you've got that good topic and you think this is information people can use, sell it describe it, get it out there. And many times I've had some papers where in the end we didn't use it because the industry found a better way. We found, or and yeah, even I'm wrong once in a while, we've published something like, wow, we missed the boat on that. We That paper is terrible. Look at, look at what uh, somebody else did at IBM or somebody at Celestica. They really, when they ran their DOE, they, we had the wrong variables and they had the right ones. So I think it's, you know, admit you're wrong, have fun. Um, yeah, and and push for those opportunities. It's getting hard this year when no one got to go anywhere. And so now this video exchange where I I was so pleased to see the SMTA's international show uh, when they did it virtual, um, it scared me. It was so good that it's like, do we really need to be going to shows? We still need to. I think I, I missed the human interaction. But now we have this mixture. We've proven some electronics goes a long way. and and. Being comfortable in the camera, like you said, is a skill one needs. It's vital. You've got to have it to push the technology and push the industry. Dave, uh, you are a wealth of information. Thank you so much for being my guest today. To say thank you for having me on. It's been a privilege. Uh, I like, I steal your stuff. Uh, a lot of my, uh, Doug actually gets mad once in a while because I'm using your cleaning cells, not his. Because uh, so please keep doing what you do because uh, a lot of us use it and, and we take it down to that younger crowd as as our basics for learning and, and starting their careers and, and understanding what they should do. But no, it's uh, been fun today and hopefully the audience uh, finds some nuggets in here that they can use to uh, solve problems for themselves. Good. And the next time, hopefully the next time we see each other, it's face to face um, uh, with uh, with a bar in front of us and a bartender behind that bar and and uh, we can reminisce about the times when we couldn't get out. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm all for that. Absolutely. And thank you so much for being my guest today. You're a wealth of information. I appreciate all the knowledge you have and your willingness to express that knowledge and impart that knowledge to my audience. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, that's another episode. Thanks for listening to the Reliability Matters podcast. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Reliability Matters on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or virtually wherever you get your podcasts. A special thanks to Circuit Assembly Magazine's PCB Chat at pcbchat.com and Ascendo Reliability at reliability.fm for syndicating this show. Thanks for your questions and episode suggestions. Please keep them coming. Send comments to mike at mikeconrad.com. That's Conrad with a K. Once again, thanks for listening and keep doing it right. Thanks for listening to the Reliability Matters podcast. Join us on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month for new episodes of Reliability Matters.